Uh, so our next speaker is joining us from the internet. Uh, Alan Gordetsky from UC Irvine will be talking about his work inspired by cephalopods. Hi. So hopefully everyone can see uh, and hear me. So thank you for inviting me to uh, give a talk. Uh, my sincerest apologies. My only regret is that I, I could not be there in person. Unfortunately, I had a uh, family circumstances that prevented that prevented travel. But I sent one of my stellar students in my place uh, who can answer any questions. Um, and it's been great to hear some of the wonderful talks this morning. And I think they're fantastic context for what I'm going to talk about, uh, which is what my group does, uh, which is materials and systems inspired by cephalopods. And in that uh, overarching introduction that, that I wrote in, uh, you know, before knowing the exact time, I'm going to focus on one story, and that's our work on thermoregulatory materials uh, inspired by squid skin. Um, so we're really inspired to work on this from a, from a historical context of thinking about camouflage or, or shape shifting. You know, there are many examples uh, uh, for, in the Greek gods and in the Middle Ages, you can see on the top row here, uh, where people have thought about this for a long time. Like Vertumnus, the, the god of seasons, you know, these wood cuttings of, of vampires uh, and werewolves. And these days we have our own mythology, uh, you know, this, this kind of science fiction-esque concept of shapeshifters. And these two clips will really illustrate that. There's Mystique from X-Men popping up and changing shape, uh, which this is what you would look like if you saw that in real life. And here's one from Jurassic World. We have a fictional dinosaur uh, that does something very similar. <laughs> Thank you, Chavata. So if you saw those two things, you know, you'll be amazed. You would never think that that could be a real life. But nature can play some pretty inc incredible camouflage tricks in its own right. Now, many people are familiar with, with lizards, uh, with frogs that can hide in the leaves, uh, berries that maintain this beautiful blue and never fade over hundreds of years, uh, you know, butterflies or insects that look exactly like plants. Um, but, you know, people, you're not as familiar, or many people are not as familiar with w the amazing things that cephalopods can do. Um, which which are far beyond anything that you, that you find with those with those other animals, and I think this video really illustrates the point nicely. I have to admit, I was screaming when I got this video thing. What makes a marine biologist scream? So you know, I started in this area when I saw that video, and to me, it was something as amazing as as, as out of a sci-fi movie. Just seeing this this camouflage capability manifest itself in real life, uh, and as my starting point, I really started thinking about how the skin of these of these animals works, uh, and specifically a simplified version, uh, which you can see is illustrating you know, this squid. Uh, it's uh, you eat it as calamari, uh, you know that that someone's filming and it's flashing, it's changing color, and it's changing transparency. And it's doing that because it's got this highly innervated skin structure where it has small organs called chromatophores, which are pigmented organs on the bottom left here. Uh, and, and also these collections of cells called splotches, which are filled with, with the iridophores. And those two units work together to enable these transparency and color changing effects. Um, and we were specifically fascinated by, by chromatophores, uh, you know, because of their, of their properties, the fact that they can be mechanically actuated uh, where effectively a chromatophore is a small pigment-filled sac encircled by radio, uh, radial muscle fibers. So it starts out as a fairly small point. It can be very tiny. Uh, and then these muscle fibers expand that pigment-filled sac uh, into something that's much, much larger area. And you can see a, a picture of one chromatophore in the middle doing this. Uh, that then changes how light is transmitted, reflected, and absorbed by the skin. And in our earliest, very baseline rudimentary experiments, we made a straightforward version of this, actually using natural materials that are derived uh, from uh, chromatophores, uh, where we, we would coat a layer, a thin layer, um, uh, on, a, on a plastic film, and we would stretch it, and that could change how this material reflected in infrared light. Um, and that kind of gave us, gave us the idea, well, could we make something artificial and more practical uh, rather than using a protein found in these in these uh, organs, uh, something that 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 could be technologically useful. Uh, and so, when we started this project, we initially had actually partnered with 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 Under Armour, and I'll tell you a whole story about about this project. And they were really interested in making clothing that would keep you warm or cool on demand. 
Uh, so for example, something that would have a cloth that in a warm thermal environment would allow heat to escape from the human body, but in a cool thermal environment would trap it and where you could reversely toggle it between the two on demand by the user. Uh, and so effectively do, do it under user control rather than autonomously. It even made a video kind of illustrating this. Uh, this is what they call Future Girl, out of someone dialing in their temperature, putting on an athletic suit, uh, and, and going for a run. So, so it was a really great partnership to get us off the ground. Um, and the way that we approach this is we thought about taking this classic technology of the space blanket, you know, the, and the NASA component of this conference, I think I think this is a really appropriate uh, source source of inspiration, you know, where you have this metalized plastic sheet that's incredibly good at reflecting infrared radiation, as you can see in the top row. And we want to merge that with the idea of these chromatophores going from large plates to tiny points uh, where they will be toggled back and forth to add a dynamic aspect to that material. Uh, and so the bottom row is our design strategy uh, and, and our initial kind of, you know, proof of principle uh, concept was to put this into a sleeve, but our design strategy was to have a metal layer that would be embedded within a polymer by post to give it mechanical stability. And that layer would, would be fractured when you fabricate. And then by pulling the polymer, you could stretch those islands uh, apart and bring them back together controllably. So it's in the same way that if you you broke a mirror into little pieces, you could get those pieces to come apart and come back together. Uh, and so, you know, we spent quite a bit of time, uh, and when I say quite a bit of time, it's summarized in one slide, but it's, you know, almost a year of, of, of grad student uh, work and, and suffering and effort. Uh, my student, Alexandra, uh, who's been involved with this project, can tell you. But essentially, we figured out how to do this in a very straightforward way where we would grow nanostructured columns embed them within the polymer. You can actually see this in this in this layer here. We have embedded copper nanostructures and then delaminate the film from the substrate to get this microstructured fractured material. And so when you take that material, this is what we call the, a, a composite, um, and, you, and you stretch it, not only does it become more transparent, um, but, uh, but uh, it, it also uh, moves the islands that you've put in there from the fabrication process because you fractured it into small microstructures. It's actually a consequence of making films in this way, which is normally considered to be a bug, a big disadvantage, but we turn it into a feature. Um, these islands can be brought, uh, brought apart and brought back together reversibly depending on the strain that you put on the material. So that's what's happening at the microstructural level. But at the centimeter scale, what this does is it'll, it controls how your material transmits and reflects infrared radiation. So for example, in its unactuated state where all the islands are together at 0% strain, uh, it reflects all, all, all infrared radiation, transmits nothing. But in its actuated state, when all the islands are apart, uh, it, it, it transmits quite a significant fraction uh, of the IR on over pretty large uh, windows, which, which we've tested. And, you know, by, by really playing with the microstructure, we developed such a good understanding that we could model and simulate this very precisely. Um, so you really can barely tell these traces apart, uh, but there is an experiment on here and a simulation uh, where the points overlay almost exactly because of the fact that we had, we understood the, the theory of how, how our materials were working so well. Uh, so, so taking that, um, we could now predict how this material would work in, in an environment. Uh, and the way that we did this is we used a combination of experiments and modeling uh, to, to, to uh, calculate and, and validate the set point temperature. Uh, and the set point temperature is essentially uh, the temperature that you keep a building at in order for a person to be quite comfortable. Uh, and you can see this indoors, uh, you know, and because most of the heat loss that happens in our body is through radiative, this is a picture on the left of an athlete running, and they're losing quite a bit through, through radiative heat. Under certain conditions, the, the uh, regime where this works is very, is very important. Um, you could tune the set point temperature over quite a large range. Uh, so, for example, you, you could have our material function as, you know, the, the same way at a space blanket, um, you know, uh, at, at, at these set point temperatures here, or you could have it function the same way as linen or rayon um, at higher set point temperatures. Effectively, that means that it would function like very loose, light clothing uh, when it's warm and would trap all the heat uh, when it's cold. Right, uh, And so this is very, very salient for reducing building energy consumption because if each person is wearing this type of material that's fabric integrated, uh, you can do quite a bit uh, towards mitigating uh, the amount of energy that you use to heat and cool buildings.
Uh, and we we actually tested this in practical settings. We made a wearable thermal management system, that sleeve that I had showed you, and a person could actually wear that sleeve, uh, or grad students in this case, go into a cold room and comparatively see how you could modulate the your, your comfort, at least in one arm in real time, um, and you could tune uh, how comfortable your arm would stay with, with careful calibration. So in the unactuated state, this material works exactly like a space blanket, but you can tune it to, to control the temperature of your arm however you want, depending on, on what's happening around you. Um, and so, you know, we haven't made Future Girl yet, but but we've made Future Sleeve. Uh, you know, so uh, so this is kind of our, our, our comparison here of the sleeve uh, to a squid. Um, and so we've, we've really, you know, now now tried to to advance this material further, uh, and we've explored a lot of different applications. And I'll tell you one. I'll tell you about uh, you know, squid skin inspired uh, uh, food packaging. I know cause, because you can not only use this material for wearables, but you can also use it, uh, you know, for for controlling uh, food packaging containers or warm beverages. Um, so, for example. You know, uh, you can have this 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 material around a, a coffee cup, and you can control both the internal and external temperature. Uh, in order to enable this, in order to enable large packaging, we had to figure out how to manufacture this on a more practical scale. So we've made scalable large area versions of this of this material. So we've effectively, you know, a scale the size from starting with centimeter squares to 0.3 meters squared. Um, you can see a, a quilt like sheet. Uh, one of my students is holding up in the in the bottom right here, and the processes are the same except we swapped out the substrates, we changed the spray coating. Uh, you know, we could delaminate the same way, but really the idea was to convert everything to industry standard processes that you could transfer to to a factory scale and make it easier to fabricate these these nanostructures. So with this manufacturing material, uh, you know, it, it even though you scaled it to much larger areas, it works the exact same way. So our understanding still holds up. You still have these domains that are fractured. Um, you still have this loss in reflectance and increase in transmittance. And you can even now predict these the specular to diffuse components of that infrared transmitting transmittance and reflectance, underscoring the understanding that I that I talked about before. Uh, and you can validate the thermal regulatory properties again. So in its unactuated state, we always benchmark this against this space blanket. It's just a classic. I know the material works effectively the the same way as a space blanket, but you can control the thermal flux uh, that goes through it. Uh, you know, especially in, in model systems that are made to emulate human skin, kind of like that sleeve that that we had tested before. Um, you can indeed use this for food packaging applications. You know, I love to get up every day with a with a cup of coffee, um, and so. Oh, we actually tested this in a warm cup of coffee to see how it would control both the internal and external temperature using thermocouples, uh, you know, and, and all sorts of carefully calibrated measurements and, and an IR camera. Uh, and you can basically, basically effectively control the cooling rate of your, of your cup of coffee to get it to cool uh, on demand. So, you know, you your hand stays cool, your coffee stays warm. Um, you know, and this is a concept that can be applied for any uh, body that's that's cooling or warming at a, at a specific temperature. Um, and so really, again, underscoring how well we understand this material, there's not only the measured values here, but also the calculated values that compare to each other. So you really, you know, have, have a material that works exactly the way that you would expect it to, where the theory and experiment are almost in complete agreement, which is quite rare. This was actually a surprise for us. Uh, and, and really, I think this will open up just a tremendous number of opportunities. It was great to, to have uh, the talks uh, before that mentioned buildings and that, you know, that talked about the difficulties of finding, th you know, thermal management solutions for different situations, uh, let, let's say in water. Well, we think this material has the flexibility and modularity to span a very broad range, you know, from personal thermal management, which you started with, I showed you here in the top right to food packaging and beverage packaging, which I showed you in the top left, to tents, uh, you know, which I also talked about, and, and of course, infrared camouflage, which is a big motivating factor for us because anytime you can manage thermal emissions, you can potentially also manage thermal signatures. Oh, that's another uh, thrust and, and topic in my, in my group. Um, you know, so now I get to the most important part, the acknowledgements. Uh, you know, I have a wonderful group of students uh, who have really uh, spearheaded some of this work. Uh, Alexandra is there on site. She was instrumental, uh, you know, for that food packaging paper, uh, and she can answer any questions. I think she even has, you know, samples that that, that you can that you can play around with. Um, she's here, and and my funding, and of course, thank you for listening. And just disclose that we 
just spun out a company to try and commercialize some of this stuff. So we're really excited about the future possibilities. Uh, so, so thank you again. Uh, I'm very sorry that I couldn't be there in person, especially looking at all the wonderful people, many of whom I know. Um, but but it, it's it's been a pleasure uh, li listening so far today.